Welcome everyone to today's UCLA Longevity Center webinar. And I want to introduce um, our special guest and speaker today, Dr. Barbara Nadison Horowitz. She is a cardiologist and an evolutionary biologist on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and Harvard University's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology and the David Geffen School of Medicine here at UCLA. So her phylogeny lab studies wildlife and the natural world as a source of insights to improve health and development across species. So Dr. Nadison Horowitz recently launched Female Health Across the Tree of Life, which is a research initiative bringing together leaders in women's health, One Health, and Planetary Health. She also is the author of a New York Times bestseller, Zobiquity, and co-authored with Katherine Bowers. And this was a, she was a finalist in the American Association for the Advancement of Science Excellence in Science Book Awards, a Smithsonian top book of 212. So um, without further delay, I, I'd like to bring you and welcome Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz. And welcome, Dr. Horowitz. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here and excited to talk to this group. So, um, and thank you for that kind introduction. So my work um, is at this point, I spent, by the way, the first over 20 years of my career as a clinician, as a clinical cardiologist at, at UCLA mostly. Um, and uh, as you'll hear in just a second, I, I had some experiences that began to shift my perspective. But all of my work in the last 15 years is, um, rests on a, a sort of a single assumption, an idea. And that is that my field, the field of human medicine, has centuries, if not millennia, of a very human-focused approach. It has been um, decidedly anthropocentric. And my belief is that by expanding that window um, beyond the handful of model organisms that we use um, in laboratory investigation to better understand human health, but if we can expand um, how we perceive health and disease to include the other over 160 million metazoan species with whom we share the earth, looking at um, both differences and commonalities, if we can do that, and then if we can open the window, widen it once again to include the evolutionary history that um, explains the both the differences and those similarities, and that's depicted by this phylogeny in here. Um, if we can do that and take into account the environment that is now affecting all species on Earth, that we can then better understand why we get sick, the causes of disease, and that we can um, do a better job coming up with solutions, be more innovative in how we um, how we approach uh, and more innovative and more effective in how we approach um, health challenges. So th that's really, um, in, in a way, that's my claim for today. And what I'm going to do is hopefully make good on that in a few minutes um, that I have. So I'm going to quickly take you through my journey, how I uh, ended up doing this and thinking this way, talk a little bit about this um, causation um, claim, uh, talk about this biomedical innovation claim. In other words, how can this approach, how can widening that window, um, how can that accelerate innovation? How can that let us understand causation better? Talk a little bit about the future and then hopefully I will have sparked um, some ideas and interests and we'll have a Q&A. So let me take you back, uh, back to, well, gosh, the early, really 1990s. Um, uh, I've been at UCLA for a very long time, uh, but I, I finished my cardiovascular fellowship at UCLA. I did a year of heart failure and cardiac imaging, and I came on faculty. And I was practicing cardiology, doing teaching, all the things that we do as academic cardiologists, um, until about 2005, something changed. I continued to practice, and I was you know, doing all of that. But I got a telephone call um, from um, the veterinarians of the Los Angeles Zoo. And it was uh, the first of what became many calls, actually decade, a decade and a half of a relationship, um, asking me to help with the cardiovascular care of some of their animals. And so I had an opportunity to see quite a, a wide range of animals over many years. Uh, this was a chimpanzee who they who had, had a, they thought had had a stroke, a neurological event, and 
this was, I was doing a transesophageal echo to look for blood clots in the heart that might have explained the stroke. This is what we do in humans, of course. Um, this was a gorilla. They were worried about a tear in the aorta um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and I, you know, I, that's a whole other talk, but um, essentially what I was doing um, after several years of doing this, I began um, wondering how I could use this knowledge to really improve my work as a physician, to take better care of my patients, to teach medical students in a more effective way. How could I use this knowledge to improve human health? Um, I ended up, along with Catherine Bowers, um, writing a book. We started conferences. And of course, I am certainly not the first physician to recognize that there is this profound connection between the health of humans and animals. The father of modern pathology, um, Rudolf Virchow, wrote in the 19th century, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, different I'm going to move, but the experience obtained constitutes um, the basis of all medicine, right? Um, so I ended up, um, the, the first book, Ubiquity, was published. It's out now actually a decade. It's literally 10 years ago, last month. Um, and this was a book that looked at human health through the lens of evolution, um, veterinary medicine, wildlife biology, and such. Well, um, over the course of um, seeing animals uh, occasionally when I was called at the LA Zoo, um, I remember one case uh, particularly well, and that was uh, this patient, and her name was Cookie. Cookie um, was a, a lion. She was um, a female lion at the LA Zoo for a very long time. Um, she and Lionel was the, was the male lion, were kind of partners for a long time. Um, but she developed progressive shortness of breath, and, and it turned out uh, they, they were very worried about um, they thought that she had collected fluid around her heart in her pericardial sac. And um, when I asked why, uh, because it was, you know, the, the, the logical next question in a way, um, the veterinarian said that she was worried that she had metastatic breast cancer. And I remember, <laughs> I remember hearing that from the veterinarian and um, having that kind of disruptive moment, because here was a disease that obviously we saw so much of in internal medicine, um, we, you know, cancer can metastasize to the heart and cause this fluid, but I had really never thought about breast cancer in the context of um, another animal. Um, and I admit that with embarrassment now, um, but it really was one of several very disruptive uh, experiences that um, got me thinking in a broader way. And so um, to make a very long story short, uh, this began making me think about this breast cancer idea um, by the way, I learned uh, that breast cancer is, um, there are certain groups of mammals that have higher rates of mammary carcinoma than others. Um, and the big cats are, are one of those groups. So in any event, I started to sort of shape, or I have in the last several years began to shape this question um, towards how can I use this knowledge to improve women's health, right? Now, why women's health? Well, lots of reasons. And one of them, I think many of you are aware, um, there is a pretty um, horrible uh, recent history of women's health research being pretty much ignored. So until the um, Congress passed the NIH Revitalization Act and Clinton signed it into law, until 1993, right, most clinical trials that were conducted in the US and funded by NIH, our leading funder, excluded women, or there were very few women, most. That's a pretty, I mean, when I think that 1993, I was already um, done with my training, right? So, and I was unaware of that. But to make matters worse in a way, it wasn't until 2016, Francis Collins sent this, um, this white letter essentially, and a uh, white paper rather, to the scientific community um, that female, lab animals were included in those critical preclinical studies that define the basic biology of, medi of, of disease um, and response to medication and devices. So we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, so I ended up uh, kind of reconceiving this idea of what is the connection between the health of human and other animals towards what is the connection between the health of the um, female human animal and the female non-human animal. And so if, if medicine has been anthropocentric, it has also been androcentric. 
And again, uh, by increasing the window, widening that window to be more sex and gender and species spanning that we can, um, again, see, understand, and come up with better insights. And in fact, what I'm going to talk about today is the ways in which female animals are connected. And um, there are many ways we are connected both through um, shared biology, some shared biological characteristics. Um, female mammals are connected in certain ways, but female vertebrate animals are connected in some ways as well. So even if we, um, the species that we're looking at, I'm thinking about, <clears throat> may not be um, from an evolutionary perspective, very, very closely related, like chimpanzees are our closest um, you know, living species. We shared an ancestor about 7 million years ago. Even animals that are very different, like even fish or reptiles, um, females share certain characteristics. And by the way, may I say, a similar um, dense nexus of connections um, exists between male animals, right? But, but for today and for um, this initiative, I've been focusing on female animals. All right. Uh, so that's how female health across the tree of life was born. And the PNAS, the, the paper came out, I guess, in uh, just a, a few months ago. And I think that triggered this invitation. So thank you for that. All right, let's talk about the first of the two ways. So there are two major kind of um, categories of connection that I, that I think about. The first is uh, shared vulnerability, the connection that a female animal on planet Earth has with other female animals around uh, vulnerability to disease. And I think everybody recognizes this expression, canary in the coal mine. And this is actually, um, uh, I love this, this photograph. This is from the Smithsonian Magazine. So at the, um, in the early part of the 20th century and sort of the end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, uh, British coal miners started carrying little canaries in, in wooden or metal cages into the coal mines. And um, they, these little tiny animals are smaller than humans, right? And as a result, if there was a carbon monoxide leak, um, the, the canary would die, you know, swiftly compared to the human uh, who presumably there would be more time. But this is a way of detecting danger in the environment. And now we talk about the canary in the coal mine, but there actually was a canary in the coal mine, right? So um, what is happening now? Well, what's happening is we're seeing um, in the Anthropocene, we're seeing obviously not just accelerated climate change, but environmental degradation. And one of the consequences of these changes is a blurring of boundaries between human and animal environments, right? In the past, there was a clear demarcation between human and uh, non-human animal environments, and that's changing. Here is one um, example. So this is, uh, many of you will recognize, the northeast um, corner of Canada. Uh, there's Quebec right here. And what we see here is something called the St. Lawrence Estuary. Um, and between 1983 and 1998, uh, let's go here, there were, um, oops, there we are. Okay, so there were, there were beluga whales that, um, so belugas, there are belugas in different parts of the world, but the St. Lawrence, Lawrence Estuary is one of the sort of iconic places that they've been studied. Um, Daniel Marchino and his group. Uh, but beluga whales started to die. And actually, um, necropsies were done um, on many of them. And it was discovered that about 20% of them, uh, the adults, had, had cancers. And the females had um, higher rates. About 27% of the females had cancers. And many, many of them had memory carcinoma. Some of them also had ovarian carcinoma. And this was um, something that caught people's attention. Uh, so what was uh, kind of, you could see that there was a, this is um, the years and this is the number of cases. And so um, obviously this represented a change. And it turned out, I'm, I'm sure nobody will be surprised uh, to learn that this was related to human contamination and um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that were being produced by these aluminum smelting factories. Um, and um, what is, of course, interesting is that the, uh, all of it's interesting, but what is salient to women's health is that um, women in these coastal communities were also experiencing an uptick in certain adenocarcinomas, re reproductive adenocarcinomas. And so um, ultimately, these, uh, these factories were closed. And so this is an example of uh, the health of, of the, the, the breast health, the mammary health of these whales uh, were sort of um, alerted us to this threat that was affecting humans. And um, it is, 
it, the opportunity to think this way is, is endless. Um, we don't typically think this way. Uh, this is an example of the blurred boundaries, right? We have wildlife um, coming up adjacent to um, urban environments. And um, I have actually, in the last several years, I've been working on a number of papers related to this. I, I sit in my office and I look at the sycamore trees outside and I see lots of squirrels and occasionally I see a rat and um, raccoons and whatnot. And I think about the female animals there and I think about their endometrial tissue and I think about their breast tissue and they ovulate. And, and I think, how does their health um, impact my health and my daughter's health? And what are those connections? And I think there's an opportunity to um, kind of uh, pull off the blindfold of, of sort of human exceptionalism or whatever you want to call it and recognize that the exposomes, right, the, the accumulated exposures of human and non-human animals um, are becoming more similar and that's an opportunity for us to um, understand our health in that context. Um, and it also is an opportunity for us to begin thinking about our responsibility as a species. Uh, it is, uh, no, will come as no surprise to any of you that our species has had a devastating impact on the planet and particularly on um, countless other species. And so it's not just that animals living in and around our environments can tell us about our health, that we can, if we choose to, if we think it's important, um, use what we understand about the impact of environment on our health to um, improve the health of other female animals. And so one of the things that I did in the paper was to um, uh, develop these taxonomies of disease vulnerability. In the case of mammary cancer, um, found mammary vulnerability in every lineage of mammal. Uh, there, there's at least one case that I could find in the peer-reviewed literature. So from, from sea lions and, and, and cougars to, um, you know, armadillos and sloths and, and, and koalas, right? So, so this is a vulnerability that's quite ancient. And that means that shared vulnerability coupled with shared exposures um, means shared pathology, potentially. Um, I was also very interested, um, I have been interested for several years in looking at uh, menstruation, what mammals do menstruate, what mammals don't menstruate, and what is the relationship between that and endometriosis and other endometrial pathology. So um, similarly um, for the endometrium. But even though, um, these are all mammals and the connection we're showing that there's this vulnerability between being a human woman, a, a human female and a non-human animal female. Um, it goes beyond mammals, right? It actually extends, it extends to reptiles, amphibians and fish, which is why these cases of ovarian carcinoma in birds and in fish have sal are salient to um, to ovarian um, pathology in humans. And so that's essentially that piece of this shared vulnerability story. Um, and this connection is very ancient, right? So if we see animals around us, uh, if we see um, salmon and trout, I think, and perch, I think all of those were on the um, ovarian cancer taxonomy with ovarian cancer, and we have ovarian cancer, then in, as an evolutionary biologist, one of a, a hypothesis is that the common ancestor, the common female ancestor between human and non-human, those species, also shared vulnerability, right? That, that the biological characteristics that make us vulnerable to ovarian cancer um, existed uh, in ancient, ancient times. And there are many important consequences of that, which we don't have time uh, to really touch on today, but um, that's the idea of shared vulnerability. Um, I'm now going to pivot from this idea that, that um, we are connected through shared vulnerability to um, the inverse of that, which is we are connected, we female humans are connected to the health of non-human non females. Um, in this other way that has to do with um, our differences. So commonality and vulnerability is sort of one side, um, difference and unique um, resistance and resilience is the other. And so I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and go back and do this in a little bit of the old school way, which is going to be right here. And are you seeing um, the United States? 
Yes, I can't see anybody. Can somebody? Yes, we are. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to take a tiny little. Um, we're going to we're going to do evolution one hundred and one. All right, kind of going back to college for just a second to kind of get our our timeline straight. All right, so the um, the origins of the Earth, if, if it's about five big, big bangs, about eleven billion Earth, about five or so, five billion or so. So let's take a look and let's imagine that the history of of, of the Earth and then life on Earth is um, from is the same as an airplane trip from LAX to New York City. All right, so let's see um, when all of these things are happening. All right, so this is going to be, um, the Earth is about uh, four and a half billion years old or so. Um, we're going to be seeing life on Earth happening sort of between Arizona and, and Colorado right there. Um, we're going to see photosynthesis um, over there. And now it's not going to be until the western part of Pennsylvania that we are going to see multicellular organisms, so the beginning of animal life. And that is um, sort of the focus of, of all of my work. And that represents about 600 million years, right? So back in Los Angeles, that was about four and a half billion to five billion. And now here we are at about 600 million years and we've got New York over here. So let's see what happens next. So in the course of um, across Pennsylvania, we're gonna see plants, we're gonna see amphibians, we're gonna see dinosaurs. Now we're gonna actually begin to see the end of the dinosaurs, the um, emergence of mammalian dominance, common ancestor with chimps. And here we are 200,000 years ago and only 570 feet from touchdown in New York City, our species evolves. And this is a, I think, very dramatic way of um, kind of coming to terms with um, how, how much of our biology um, is shared with the animals that have come before us. And I say that because this amount of time, 200,000 years, is a not a lot of time for um, fundamental biology to change. We are unique in certain ways, of course, but we are far more similar in our biology and our vulnerability than we are different. So um, this is just to kind of uh, give context and perspective. Now, that insight, this idea that we have commonality, but we also have difference, can be leveraged to um, come up with new approaches to complex uh, human medical challenges. So this is um, a phylogeny. I used that word before. And of course, phylogenies are the family trees that evolutionary biologists use to show the relationship between different species and their characteristics. And um, the process of speciation, that is a word that describes um, how new species are formed, how they are, um, how environments and natural selection uh, produce new types of organisms. And so here we have this phylogeny and it's kind of swooped around um, the x-axis is time. But you can see that um, we have this common ancestor, right? This single celled organism 3.6 billion years ago. Um, we have uh, fish over here, right? So the shared vertebrate ancestor, amphibians, reptiles, birds. And here we are mammals over here. Now, we have a lot of shared biology, right? We, are, we share vulnerability to, let's say, ovarian cancer with fish. But we also are unique. And so um, the divergence of these lines represents the unique physiology, the speciation, the difference. And we are connected to other females in that we both share biology and we each species have differences. And some of those differences in other female animals may contain biology and physiology that has solved problems that we can't solve in our own species. So that um, evolution has solved some of those problems. So let me be a little clear about what um, I mean. Um, and actually, I will quote Charles Darwin, um, and this is a typo, of course, it's 1859, but. Um, Origin of species, he writes that natural selection, right? This the process that that shapes um, different species and organisms is a power incessantly ready for action and immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts. The translation of this is that evolution solves problems very effectively. 
Now, what do I mean by solves problem? What kind of problems? Well, uh, so I think many of you are familiar with um, fish that live in, in the Arctic and actually also the Antarctic, that there are species of fish that can swim healthily through um, sub, sub, sub freezing water. If you place a fish, a tropical fish, a fish or fish who's just, you know, um, not from um, a, an Arctic or Antarctic region in frigid water, the blood crystallizes into ice and the animal dies just as we would. But over um, really in, in the case of this adaptation, hundreds of millions of years, these um, fish found themselves in environments where which were very cold and in order to survive certain individual you know, um, mutations and um, and modifications led to this adaptive solution. So in essence, and what the fish do is they um, are able to produce a substance that they put into their blood, which is, is sort of like antifreeze. And so um, it, it, it lowers the, um, the freezing temperature. So that's an innovation, right, that these fish have come up with. Well, um, there is a field that has emerged in the last 25 years, which sort of leverages this knowledge, this idea that evolution, um, that this process has shaped um, animals and plants and all life um, to help them solve problems in their environment to be um, have higher fitness. And that if we can think of human challenges in the right way and, and figure out what animal challenges conform to the human challenges, that we may be able to find solutions in nature for problems that we are not haven't done a good job solving on our own. So here's an example um, from engineering. This is a photograph of um, the bullet train in 1964. This was the debut of the bullet train. It was a really big deal in Japan. It was sort of Japan was back after the war. It was very successful. Um, it was fast. It was um, it, it was terrific, but there was one significant problem. It was a design problem. When these fast moving trains were decelerating into the station, uh, there was a huge amount of vibration and reverberation, and it was causing all kinds of problems. Fortunately, one of the engineers um, was an amateur ornithologist. He was a birder. He knew birds, and um, he knew about a bird called the kingfisher. Now the kingfisher is, um, there are a number of kingfisher uh, species, but they're known for their um, iconically long and tubular and smooth beaks. And the, um, the adaptation, the solution in, in essence that this, um, this beak had solved was the problem of entering the water and creating ripples, um, which would scare off the food below, the fish below. And so the kingfisher beak had evolved to be very, very smooth and to, pierce the water without inducing ripples. And so um, this was known by um, Eiji Nakatsu, who then um, redesigned the nose of the bullet train um, and other features to um, conform to this. So this was a very big success. This is called biomimicry. Um, and so what I am really interested in is using this approach to solve challenges in human medicine, in, in women's health specifically. Um, and so whether it's looking at osteoporosis and how it is that some species, um, the panda is one, um, you know, we, we know that when, when we stop ovulating um, at a certain age and therefore we stop having menstrual periods, but that um, our risk of developing osteoporosis rises. And um, a central reason for that is that we stop uh, the estrogen surges that are helpful in maintaining bone, bone density are gone. Now, it's interesting that in other species, such as the panda, um, pandas ovulate basically once a year. They, they have a 72-hour window of fertility. Um, that's a whole other story. But their femurs are very, very um, dense and strong, and they've been studied. So they have evolved an adaptation that allows for maintaining bone density in the absence of ovulation. And I wonder, how could we use um, this knowledge? Um, could this be a, a kind of blueprint or a guideline for how we think about innovation in osteoporosis? Another challenge in women's health is our, our fertility. We, um, our, our window closes you know, by our 30s or 40s, um, which has huge consequences, not just medically, but socially and in all kinds of ways. Um, and there are non-human um, females who uh, 
who retain fertility much longer than we do. The Greenland shark is probably the, the big winner, and, I, and I've been working on this for several years, but um, the Greenland shark is a, is a large shark up in uh, the Arctic area. And they are they are viviparous. In other words, they have a placenta and they they gestate their um, their pups for um, actually a long gestation period, maybe an eight year gestation period. But they um, they live for about four hundred to five hundred years. They live for four hundred to five hundred years. They don't hit puberty until about one hundred and fifty years of age. But then once they hit puberty and they start to ovulate, they ovulate, they conceive and they gestate and then deliver healthy pups for hundreds of years. And so what are the biological mechanisms that allow them to do that? Are any of them, um, can they provide a blueprint for thinking about human health and reproductive senescence in our species? Um, a, a fascinating, uh, another couple of examples, and I think I'll stop so that we can have some questions, but um, uh, another couple of fascinating uh, animal, female animal adaptations um, there, there is something that um, a, a biological possibility called diapause that you see in animals, at least 130 mammals, and, and actually I'm sure many, many more than that, where a female can conceive, but um, that doesn't mean that, that that conceptus is going to implant in the uterus and go on to go through a full pregnancy. That actually what happens in a bat is one, um, one species, uh, certain kinds of bats is that there the blastocyst that early embryo goes into a kind of a state of, of healthy suspended uh, animation and it remains that way until the environment changes and um, that's a signal for it to implant in the uterine wall and to and to gestate in other words nature has provided a kind of uncoupling of sex and conception with pregnancy progression and birth and um, so that's a that's a whole other story, but it's that kind of um, what what can we what can we learn from that? Um, this is a, a a range of species that we covered in the in the PNAS paper, but I I um, want to just spend three minutes on the project that I spend most of my time um, on, which is related to per, to giraffes and female giraffes. So there are um, uh, a couple of things that. Um, that we can say about giraffes. First of all, I mean, I, I love them beyond. And um, now that I study them, I'm it's a it's a love affair that just gets stronger. Um, of course, giraffes are best known for the iconic long neck. And that long neck is is one of the reasons why they um, the females are so fascinating and impressive. So um, the long neck, of course, why did it evolve? Well, it provides certain advantages, right? Access to treetops. Um, predator scanning, right, being able on the savanna to see from a distance um, risk, and then actually sexual selection, um, uh, which is increasingly recognized as an important um, part of why the neck evolved. And actually, if you look at the evolutionary history of the, the neck, um, this is again another phylogeny. We see um, this is the x-axis that is time, so this is the present. And the modern giraffe, there are four species of modern giraffe. Um, the common ancestor uh, with the modern okapi, um, I don't know if any of you have seen okapis, they're pretty um, interesting, but these two are the only surviving species from giraffidae. The others are extinct. And the okapi and the giraffe shared a common ancestor 11 and a half million years ago. And the okapi does not have a long neck. The giraffe does. The okapi, um, the okapi's ancestors went into the rainforest in the Congo, the giraffe from the savanna. The point is that the long neck that the giraffe evolved um, meant that the brain is up here, the heart is down here, that can be three meters. And that means that there's a lot more pressure on the heart than there would be for an okapi. And in fact, the giraffe has the highest blood pressure of any animal, um, any of the, uh, in the animal queendom, as I like to say. So what, um, why is that interesting to me as a cardiologist? Well, high blood pressure is responsible for two of the most serious pathologies in women. One is heart failure. Um, we know that when um, men and women, but 
I'm going to focus on women, have high blood pressure that isn't recognized and treated, that their ventricle gets very, very thick, their heart, their left, their, the heart muscle gets very thick and filled with fibrosis, and it, 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 they develop heart failure. They have difficulty with exercising, and, and it gets progressive and progressive. And it's a specific form of heart failure. Well, what is remarkable about the giraffe is the giraffe has this high blood pressure. And in fact, this is a giraffe heart. And you can see compared to the human, it is even thicker, right? So this is the left ventricle. And this dark part of it is, is, this, is just where the blood should be. So it's incredibly thick. And yet, unlike my human patients, who develop this thickening of the ventricle with high blood pressure and are short of breath when they're you know, going from their living room to the, to the bathroom, giraffe with these very thick ventricles still can run over 40 kilometers an hour to evade predators. And so evolution has um, solved this problem of heart failure, this type of heart failure in giraffes. And we actually have a, a nice story and some really wonderful um, genomic uh, data that um, supports the hypothesis. But this is the approach. Um, and then the other, of course, very big challenge to women is gestational hypertension, that is high blood pressure during pregnancy. And we know that um, there are a number of forms of gestational hypertension, um, uh, but we know that giraffe um, are not dealing with, I mean, they have high blood pressure. The, a pregnant giraffe, a female has this, this normal for them, but much higher than in any other species. And yet they deliver healthy calves um, and mom stays healthy. And so I'm doing a study right now with uh, in collaboration with UC San Diego and the San Diego Zoo, where we're comparing the placenta and the um, and uteri of the okapi and the giraffe to understand what is the innovation? What is the biology that allows the giraffe, um, a pregnancy in a giraffe uh, to be healthy? Um, and is there an insight that can help us with preeclampsia and other forms of gestational hypertension? So I'm gonna wrap things up by, um, by with a quote from my personal hero who is behind me um, in my, my pictures, but is Rachel Carson. And of course, you know, Rachel Carson uh, launched the modern environmental movement with, um, with the publication of Silent Spring in 1962. And she wrote, in Silent Spring, in, in nature, nothing exists alone. And in nature, no female exists alone, um, is uh, what I believe. And um, I think it's, it's sad and I maybe a little bit ironic, or I'm not sure what the word is, that Rachel Carson herself um, died two years after the publication of this book. And in Silent Spring, she really tells the story of DDT, the pesticide DDT, and how it is destroying um, these bird species, and particularly the, the health of the eggs, um, the, the integrity of the eggs and the embryos. In other words, the reproductive health of these female birds is really what she was writing about. And I think it's, um, again, I, ironic, whatever, that she died two years later of breast cancer, complications related to breast cancer. And um, it's in, been in the last only five years now that DDT has been definitively linked to um, breast cancer in women. So um, in nature, truly nothing does exist alone. Uh, and so I'm going to end, and I hope that I've um, stimulated interest and, and ideas. Um, I, I, I think the broader message I'm trying to um, to share is that because we have been locked into this sort of anthropocentric way of thinking about our health, um, it's uh, it's been a bit of a blindfold. It's this, I call it the blindfold of human exceptionalism. And that as we peel it off, we will begin to see connections, um, not just between females, also between males, but also between animals who are in the same phase of life. Um, my last book um, is deals, deals with uh, the commonalities of being in, in um, adolescence, actually, across vertebrate species. And there are all of these ways in which we are connected. And if we can broaden that window through which we're perceiving health and disease, we can see them and then better understand why we are vulnerable to getting sick, we humans, and also be put in a better position to do something um, to really prevent and um, protect our health. So that's, um, that's it for today. And I'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to 
allow some time for people to, to type in their Q&A in, in the Q&A. Don't put it in the chat, but in the Q&A, because we can see it and answer it there. And, and while people are doing that, I, I mean, there's so many things that came up for me while I was reading it that I think are relevant. Uh, the first was I fell off my chair almost when I thought of women as being canaries in the coal mine. And it's really sad and it's true. And, and not only is this a statement about women's health, but it's a statement about other canaries in the coal mine, which are have been people that have disproportionately resided in toxic and polluted areas, right? Typically people of lower socioeconomic status, people of color who have disproportionately demonstrated many of these um, non-communicable, as you talked about diseases in your article, like cancer and, and other disorders. And it's really frightening to think, but, but unfortunately a sad truth that the, our environment and our poor stewardship of the environment has really caused a lot of this. And I was wondering what you think about your work as applied to social justice and, and even beyond, you know, sex, but just, you know, social justice, people of color, poor people, et cetera. Yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, there, there are a number of um, connections that, um, that I can make. One, one is the, 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 this, this phenomenon of, of human and animal exposures being sort of overlapping, that we're seeing that um, around the world and in different kinds of um, places and, and in different ways. But, but the individuals, well, first of all, of course, the, the communities that are least responsible for this, you know, the accelerated environmental um, change are the most impacted. And that this, this World Health Organization, it's really a UN, um, th this awareness that, that women and girls are disproportionately impacted by climate, by climate alone, right. is, um, is most of that is our women and girls who are living in, uh, who are under-resourced in the first place. And so that story is, um, it's, it's a, you know, it's hard to overstate how powerful that is in um, in the overall in how human beings are going to be in, uh, affected by by what's about to happen and what is happening already. Um, but having but having said that, one of the things that was interesting to me was to keep in mind that there is that the vulnerability of females is not just about the subordinated role of women in um, society. I mean, it is largely about that, and I would never do anything to diminish the significant uh, significance of that. But I, I think that sometimes that can cause us to sort of um, not remember that as females, as the producers of large gametes, let's say, that there are biological commonalities that we have that are, um, that are an opportunity to understand and that, that are really hiding in plain sight. Well, you were talking in, in your article about our, our percentage of body fat. Right. right, so it's it's a great example. So, for example, so we are we have a higher you know women have a higher percentage of body fat than men, and actually female mammals do. And so, if you're let's say a marine mammal that's living in a contaminated environment um, where there are you know PCBs and and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, you are those are lipophilic substances, and so those are going to be stored in fat. And if you are a female, you have more fat than than the male does, and when a female starts to lactate, so so first of all, it means that females themselves are carrying around more uh, potentially carcinogenic and other disease promoting substances that puts them at risk. Number two, uh, pregnancy means that those are being transmitted to fetus. And then with lactation, we know that those are pulled out and dumped into, uh, into the neonate. And so then our health the female health begins affecting not just female but male so it really becomes this kind of additive effect but right. yes simply having um having a higher body fat but there are many other physiologic characteristics shared by female animals that that become the basis of increased risk of certain diseases a couple of questions coming in one is from um betty ann baker <laughs> and who asks, what are connections or unique features, if any, between cisgender women's health and trans women's health? Right, so it's a great question. And in this paper, we took a lot of care um, to 
um, say that we're using the, so the term female is in flux for lots of important reasons. Um, we actually are using the term female to talk about individuals who produce large gametes. Uh, so when we're talking about mammals, right, that all mammalian species are born as either with the potential to produce either small gametes, which would be spermatozoa, or large gametes, which would be um, eggs. Of course, that is um, often uncoupled from the other, you know, physical phenotype and gender and all that. So, but we're using that definition um, just for the purposes of this paper. Um, it is interesting to begin thinking about some of these, um, the effect of, of uh, a hormone of uh, gender affirming care. So um, there are differences that female female animals have in their in the EKG of their heart. So if if you look at an EKG, there's you know different segments of the EKG, and there's one part of the EKG that is called the QT, and the QT segment. And in any event, sometimes that QT um, can get too long and put patients at risk for having um, arrhythmias that are potentially fatal. And there are certain drugs. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the erythromycin and seldane. Um, anyway, so this this there are drugs that can prolong the QT. Women, female humans are more vulnerable to this than males, um, particularly during the follicular phase of the of the cycle when estrogen surges. During the luteal phase, that risk goes down. Now, what's interesting is now that um, gender affirming care um, is you know a and people are beginning to look at the physiologic changes so that patients are, can be healthy. Um, uh, the use of exogenous uh, estrogen is actually also putting trans women at risk for this particular form of arrhythmia. So there's all kinds of, um, you know, it, I mean, the connections are endless. And as we ask questions, we can find answers, but um, that's one connection. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, another great question, Pam Morrow is asking, because female animals tend to have more breasts than humans, is their risk for breast cancer higher than ours? Uh, that is a fabulous question. It, it is, yeah. That I have never actually, um, that hasn't been studied and I don't know the answer to. But what is sort of interesting is um, to look at to look at um, lactating. So I did a seminar during the, uh, a webinar through the LA Zoo during the pandemic, I think it was the first year, with a dairy veterinarian. And I had done, um, we do these ubiquity conferences in the past where we bring together sort of veterinary oncologists and human oncologists. And, but we did one called Lactation Across the Tree of Life. And we had this um, Joel Styler, who's a very busy um, dairy vet from um, the Central Valley. I mean, he's, and he, uh, and he was talking about you know, how they manage mastitis and how they manage, you know, um, cows who aren't producing enough milk. And uh, the idea was that, you know, he, that human lactators were going to learn from, you know, animal lactators and all of that. Um, so, you know, I, so one of the, this is not directly answering your question, but I think there is a massive opportunity for women's health, for, for lactation, for human lactation, which is, we know, I mean, the APA, the American Pediatric Association has just recommended that we increase to two years is now the recommended breast, you know, exclusive breastfeeding is, is maximally healthy for, for baby and for mom, right? But we know that so many women cannot accomplish that. And some of the most important reasons that they can't are things like mastitis, things like, you know, production, and then a lot of social factors. Um, it's fascinating to learn from veterinarians whose life is dedicated to milk. And um, one of the things that he says over and over is that the cows need to be relaxed, the cows need to feel cared for, that the environment is the first thing that they do when they are thinking about milk production, that noise and stress, all those things, you know, they would, they would just, that's the most obvious thing in the world. And I look back to when I was a cardiology fellow and when I was, when I had, you know, <laughs> a young infant, where we had a, we had a room behind the room where which by the ICU, where you're supposed to go in and pump, where you're, you know, in between patients. And I just think, you know, there is a lot of wisdom, obviously, in the in the animal world that is relevant to um, to, to women's health and, and particularly to breastfeeding. Oh, gosh. And then and mental health. You know, we know that so many disorders are either exacerbated by or related to complicated by stress. 
Yeah. And and so um, and we're we're looking at this not only in just anxiety, but in hypertension, right? In immune functioning. So it, yeah. you know, it makes sense. And and it makes sense to look at animals. I mean, I grew up with dogs and everything I learned about humans, you know, Mary cancer, I learned first in dogs, colitis, I learned first in my dogs. And, uh, you know, how can you not be an observer when you, when you have animals and feel connected to them, including my female dogs, different than my male dogs, which I won't get into because those are issues. Well, I, you know, but but no, it's, and, and it's so true. In my class, in my courses, I, I do focus a lot on mental health now. And actually I, I started my career um, as a psychiatrist, believe it or not. I finished medical school and I trained. I did, uh, I did my residency at NPI when it was called NPI. Um, and uh, yeah. Then, yeah. And then, uh, wow. but, and that seems like a long time ago, but increasingly it's been really interesting because um, you know, psychopathology is ubiquity. When we're writing the book, uh, it started out as maybe cancer, heart disease, you know, and then I started learning about uh, self-injury in non-human animals and sexual dysfunction. And so half of the chapters ending, ended up um, looking at behavior. But, but um, now I'm really interested, and I've done quite a lot. I, I think the next book is going to really be looking at this, that there's a, there's a lot we can learn scientifically, but also the issue of stigma and the issue of how we understand um, mental health and mental illness can be impacted by recognizing the occurrence of these challenges in other species, both in domestic animals, but also in wild animals. Um, one example I, I don't want to go over, but is, um, is uh, I, I've been working on looking at, there's a condition in horses, in goats and sheep, in, in mothers um, who have just delivered, in the case of horses, mares, who uh, will not refuse to care for, refuse to nurse, and actually will kick away a foal who tries to nurse. Now, these can be mares that have had foals before and nursed and everything was absolutely fine. Um, there are certain horse breeds where it's more common than others. So um, the first time I heard about this, I was uh, I was doing a, a research trip around, um, at, we were at a horse breeding facility and I thought that was fascinating. Of course, I thought about postpartum depression and, and wasn't sure whether, and that was early days, but it, one of the things that really got me thinking that this could be um, a not identical condition, but shared shared biology, is that they treat with oxytocin, so they give the horses oxy, mm -hmm. and also they give um, they do cervical massage, and of course cervical massage induces uterine contractions, and we know what happens with uterine contractions is that you have the flow of oxytocin, so um, they're they're trying to promote a bond between mother and foal through oxytocin and through other kinds of um, interventions that very much conform with the way we think about postpartum depression uh, in humans. So I think there's all kinds of ways to think about psychopathology. And again, and part of it is to begin thinking about this vulnerability as, as something that occurs in the natural world um, and to really kind of begin to re-examine and reframe um, how we understand why we're vulnerable. Yeah, and not to be so, as you're saying, anthropocentric, not to be so focused on ourselves, but to think out of the box to see these potential, to see these relationships and potential ways to, to help exactly. humans and animals. We have 30 seconds left, but I have to ask you, any parallels in your research in the animal world between thing, diseases in humans or disorders, I should say, in humans, like Alzheimer's disease, like autism, do you see that? In, I know we can create it in rats yeah. and mice. What about in the natural world? Um, right. So it, that is a great question. There is there is some evidence to suggest that 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 it, that that while some of the genes may exist in other species, that a unique combination of genes may um, that produce, let's say, you know, autism and uh, autism spectrum disorder, that that may be unique to human. Remember. There are certain characteristics in every species that are unique, right? It's just that we're not uniquely unique, but every species is unique. Um, interesting, you mentioned um, Alzheimer's. There, there are um, dementia syndromes in domestic dogs, for example, who are now very healthy and living for a long time. We, um, we actually have a, um, a paper in, uh, uh, it was a nature paper from about 2013 or 14, where we, we did a ubiquity conference where we looked at um, canine cognitive um, dysfunction, which is an age-related cognitive decline 
Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot we don't know, but, um, but I think if we start looking um, more carefully and with uh, better light that we're gonna learn a lot. Okay. Well, it is 101 and I really can't thank you enough for being here today. This was just such a stimulating talk and uh, Jenna says, thank you so much. A whole new way of looking at the world, very exciting. And I completely concur with that. And um, everyone, you know, again, we will make this, web, uh, this webinar available on the Longevity Center website. So tell a friend or watch it again. And uh, Dr. Natterson Horowitz, thank you so much. I look forward to your next book or next article coming out. I can't thank you enough for being here today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting right. me. Thank you, everyone, and take care. Bye-bye.